I cannot easily accept something is not political because we live in society. Any choice of being not political is a political choice. My name is Ai Weiwei. I'm an artist and an activist. I'm a writer. I'm a documentary maker. But first, I'm a human being. The poetic act has such power to drive millions of people to certain kind of conclusions about the state of being that we occupy. I'm Anish Kapoor. I'm an artist. My art isn't overtly political in any obvious way. I'm much more interested in the esoteric, the poetic, the whatever else, all the difficult stuff. Okay, wait, wait. I want to start by reading a, a small passage from Charlie Chaplin, the great comedian, yes. the great performer. Oh, performer. In his film, um, The Great Dictator from 1940, he gives this big speech. And I'm just going to read a little passage from it. Greed, he says, has poisoned men's souls, has barricaded the world with hate has goose-stepped us into misery and bloodshed. We have developed speed, but we have shut ourselves in technology. I changed the word, it was machinery. Technology that gives us abundance has left us wanting. Our knowledge has made us cynical. Our cleverness is hard and unkind. We think too much and feel too little. More than technology, we need humanity. More than cleverness, we need kindness and gentleness. Without these qualities, life will be violent and all will be lost. It is the most beautiful, beautiful speech. Clear, short. And very poignant. And, and it all, describes our time. Our situation. Perfectly. Perfect. We, uh, we think we are so technically advanced. We think we are so smart. We think we are very well educated. But we don't know what we missed and we Correct. lost. So it seems to me that there are two fundamental things missing. Wisdom. We live in a world almost without wisdom. And the other is compassion. Wisdom come from not just the, the library or, or books, but rather from uh, using your hands. The hands teaches your heart and the, your, your mind. And so the most people the today, they don't use their hands anymore, or they use hands for some other purpose. So I think we have been go too far from the so-called wisdom, because wisdom is about how do you survive your soul and your body. And now we don't really survive it. We inherit mm. so much. We are being given, but we are not appreciated. Mm -hmm. And we're taking, we don't know to whom we, we are taking from. Yes. And uh, I think this is from uh, the post-colonialism and also the so-called uh, globalization. It's a new form of uh, uh, Co colonialism. Correct. That yeah. corrupted our whole human condition. I like very much what you've just said about the hand. Traveling in so much of the world, perhaps especially in China, what we see is, what I see is, that people are being moved off the land and put into great big skyscrapers. They lose the hand and its contact with this wonderful earth that is our, that is the basis. So when you were talking about exile in the first part of the show here, you um, talked about being an outsider, but really you talked about losing your home. And one of the things perhaps we could discuss is how important is this idea of home? Well, I, I'm a person who not perfectly talk about what is home, because even in my nation, when I was born, my father was exiled, so I'm second generation of exiled person. And uh, we lost something we, which we think belongs to us, familiar, 
and we, we know if we close our eye, we can still go back to that safety corner, safe, you know, because you have a familiar smile or, or you know that corner, the little light. In communist society, nothing belongs to individual. It's not just the material doesn't belong to individual. You don't have a private feeling. You don't have a memory because all those fam memories has been changed. Mm -hmm. You know, history book tells you really different from what really happened. Mm -hmm. So the sense of a home are so altered. So is it that also as artists, we sit outside or is it that the search for home is something that, that is a continuing poetic, philosophical, uh, confusing problem. My mother's Jewish, or was Jewish. My father's Indian. So in India, we were always the Jewish boys, my brother and I. Then we went to Israel, because that's what Jewish kids do, go to Israel. They said, ah, but you're dark. So suddenly I was a darkie. Sorry? Uh, utterly confusing, utterly confusing. And Britain was much better at this, but many of our audience, I can see all over the, from all over the world, many of us will suffer this question of uh, being an outsider, of what is home, where is, how key is home to the activity that we say we want to perform, which is reconnect, if you like, with our deep psychic inner world. Um, I think uh, you raised up a very serious question. As an artist, we are, by nature, we are a person who are lost. Mm. We, mm. we choose to be lost. <laughs> we choose to be lost. So it's but a choice. I like this. Because we choose yes. to be lost, yes. that brings back the fundamental question where we belong to originally. So that we have to answer. doesn't matter where you come from what kind of religion or language or, or habit, we, we just identify us, ourselves as a human being. Mm. At the same time, we struggle for identity. You know, no artist not struggle for identity. So these two are so conflicts, you know. But it links, of course, also to the other thing, which is that I can only be an artist if I'm fragile. Yes. Once I said um, in the future, may, maybe the most powerful person is being fragile. Yeah. Because I mean, it the, is, it is, the, there's no question. all the powers Correct. are afraid of this fragileness. Correct. My fragility is my humanity. It is my ability to identify. It is that part of me which can break down in tears and be, if you like, open or vulnerable. And yet, we also carry this other side as artists of great bravado. I can, you know, make a cannon and shoot into the corner or whatever variation on such a thing. Um, meaning foolishness, stupidity. Fragility and stupidity are quite close sisters like this. Yeah. And they are, it's a very interesting problem of daring. So it's both fragile and daring and uh, how to live your life. Mm. That's the question. How do you survive from the fragileness and also to be provocative? Mm. Uh, in Chinese, we mm. say Dao, mm. that means uh, the way. Mm. So the way has to be live as one. Mm. What do you act and what do you think about the language? has come to one. That's most difficult. Maybe in that part, you can be called as an artist. Mm. That's very beautiful. There's one other really important subject. It links to all the things we've been talking about, that we educate our young people as slaves to the capitalist economic machine. Society is not interested in the individuality the freedom, the spirit of the young person. What we want is automatons. And what society does not want is young people who feel, who think, who are fragile, who are unable, who don't know. 
we'd say, no, you go and stand in the corner. I don't want to see the dark side of you. We have taken all the dark parts of our environment, every dark valley, every dark chasm, and cut it down and turned it into a nice little, if you like, forgive me, but a nice little Christian place in which everything is good, everything is well, but actually it's the death. I want your dark soul. I don't want your good self. Yeah. Um, and that is the reversal, if you like, the turning education the other way up, if you like. I totally agree that education is a big problem because we designed this system to kill the young generation. I look at my son, I think, oh, he has to do this 20 years of education. If it's <laughs> not more, <laughs> waste the best time of your life. Yeah. Then you come to the world, you think you're being trained, you just become a, a useful piece of a, uh, a machine or a, a tool. Correct. To be efficient or to to have a so-called security. I think the capitalism uses the kind of security to scare everybody to say, because you're doing that, you're safe and you're in better position. And this is crazy because you don't act. You only think you know that knowledge or you, you think you can structure some kind of knowledge, but you later think about it, you just become a doctor or mm. uh, or lawyer or Wall Street uh, trader or, you know, whatever the profession. I think that is the biggest loss of humanity. I've and, always said to my children, don't get a job. But I think we have a question from someone. Uh, my name is John Packer. I'm a professor of law. Uh, you've both raised the idea of language, art and language. And of course, it's often been said that music or the arts in general are a universal language, but not necessarily as just codification of images and sounds. There's something else happening, and I'm interested to know what you believe in your experience is happening universally through the arts. And does it require to be universal that everyone is an artist? Mm. An artist makes a work. If in the process of making the work, the artist has been able to remove enough of themselves and not get in the way, in other words, and leave space for the viewer, for you and me, to come and watch and look, then you and me complete the work. We make the works. Um, what that assumes, as you quite rightly say, is that there is a code that we share of color, of sound. There are various languages that we share, almost in spite of ourselves. Um, now, is that true or is that not true? Is it culturally specific or is it not so? Um, for example, I mean, just off the top of my head, is there an African, for example, notion of the sublime that I know nothing about? Uh, is it different, if you like, from the classical Western or whatever variation on such a thing? So is it truly universal? You know, does the color red mean the same thing in London that it does in Beijing? I doubt it. I think in Beijing it means something completely different. How we codify these things, it's, it's complex. But I do believe the main question is get the artist out of the way, meaning too much to say gets in the way, in fact, and makes for less good art. The understanding of a value about uh, art is really uh, very much like taking a drug. <laughs> it's, uh, it's not a natural... Uh, you know, we, we appreciate things, but as you said, African people uh, appreciate different things from uh, the white people. You know, the way they understand the movement, the sound, the light, the, the, it's very different. I don't think any modern sculptor can reach the same kind of language as African did. It's in their blood. You know, we only can provide the, the other experience which Africans, they, they may not even think of. That's how I think.
Hello, my name is Anita Perez, and I wanted to ask, with the rise of the internet and social media, there is more art being made and viewed than ever before. I wanted to ask, Wei Wei, what you thought about the surplus of production and consumption of artwork, and if it poses a threat or an opportunity for today's artists and their creativity. Certainly, uh, internet or te technology provide us human society something we never experienced before. Mm. And also we don't know how it would affect our, our understanding of value and uh, or exchange of values and uh, or even just to own something, you know. And uh, But certainly we can see many things have been changed. Mm. Since we use social media and the iPhones, the film become uh, in crisis, you know, mm. we don't. Most people very hard even to go to a theater to look at a, uh, a film anymore because we are used to easily to get a quick information in very short uh, time, and uh, we cannot have that same kind of patience to see the the film uh, developing or the, uh, a story. But, 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 I, I mean, I take the point about film. You're absolutely right. Film has... Um, but there are many arts that you have to experience. You know, you can't um, just have music, if you like, online in whatever forum it is. Um, it's... Especially with classical music, let's say, you have to be there. Um, it's the same with painting. It's the same with sculpture. I'm perhaps very old-fashioned in no, this way of it thinking. It will never be the same to, um, to even just like a conversation we sit together, we get I to know each other. I sense understand. The, but if we were doing this online, it would be such a different conversation, wouldn't it? Could be. <laughs> could be. But, that's no. the, but we have to realize that's another reality. Yes. Uh, we read all sorts of signs from each other. Gentle, subtle, little signs that tell us things that screens just can't. So, I accept, it's a different reality. It's very different. Hi, I'm Genevieve and I'm a student in London. I have always felt that extraordinary art makes you more than just a consumer. It immerses you completely. And my question is, how do you make your audience more than just consumers? And how important is it for you as artists that people really experience and are fully immersed in your work? I've been for many, many years in Zen practice. And in Zen, my teacher used to say to me all the time, she would say, give yourself, truly give yourself into what is being done at this moment right now. And something happens, you know, when you're truly involved in something, something happens to time. Time goes somewhere else, it becomes something else. It's as if it doesn't exist. So our job as artists is to be watchful. Beauty, in other words, is everywhere. It's right there, it's right there, it's right there, it's right there. Beauty is everywhere. All we've got to do is grab it right now. Wait, wait, what do you think? <laughs> uh, yes, I, I think it's very hard to give oh, no. <laughs> a, a rational description about the uh, art practice because it's a mythology. It's what you believe. And uh, so what do you believe? An artist can re-illustrate our sense of time and the, and the place. I think that's, that's a minimal uh, effects of uh, art. Make us uh, forget or make us uh being conscious about something we've never been conscious that moment is we forget you know so it's a it's a art should be a dangerous uh, thing to do you know it's not uh it's never safe but of course 99 percent art is not in that category um hi my name is emily flower um, and my question is um, which of the pieces that you've made do you think have had the most significant political impact and why or how? I would say none for my work I did uh, which I'm satisfying or I would think uh, it uh, creates some kind of real impact. I never can really think that can be called a work in most time, but rather to have a life 
to grab some values, I think is very important, which to which doesn't really belong belongs to me, but to the to every human being. And uh, I think those values would protect our society in in a more uh, desirable way. Yeah, you're not being a bit unfair to yourself. You had one work which had a very particular um, um, perspective, the one where you took the, the, the steel bars from Earth. the earthquake and you put them out and you spoke in that work without saying any words about an uncaring, unable state. Tell us about that. Is that true? Uh, that is true. The, the yeah. works I uh, involved me with uh, earthquake, yeah. um, which uh, killed over 5,335 students. Yeah. So I asked the simple question, who are they and what's their name? But in certain environment, this is a national secret. You mm. cannot really <laughs> ask those questions. Mm. So I made this so-called uh, citizen investigation. We made a very simple respect life, never forget. Mm. And uh, this is very essential. But to make that effort is difficult and almost finished my life because I had a confrontational mm. Mm. Uh, moment with the, the police. Uh, yes, if you name out that work that is uh, have some kind of language and form and uh, peacefully, actually, it's very violent work, but uh, have this kind of contradiction about state violence and about uh, how our memory being erased. Or... But also from a formal point of view, it's something which I imagine, and it's all about the imagination, all that steel was kind of mangled and like that, and then you straighten it and you turn it into a kind of minimalist, um, um, perfect, calm scene, whereas everything it's saying is about the uncalm, about death. This contradictory, that's what makes it art, of course, to take one situation, twist it or straighten it, turn it in another situation, and suddenly it's art. And, yeah, this, you, and this is a very interesting problem, isn't it, for, this for, we all for, do. for all of we us? We all do yeah. for any successful yeah, of art or, or of skillful artist. But the most difficult thing is what is after, because yeah. uh, I did films about the refugees, but uh, as we all know, this problem become even much worse. Of course. There's thousands of people dead in the ocean, and the mm. basically European and uh, not only European, but they want to reach Europe, but the European, they push them away. Cool. So they let them die. Cool. Cool. So, uh, yes, I made a film, I made many works, but but so what? Uh, you know, this moment, those, those kids and the women still living in the darkness. The most important thing about art is honesty, besides all the skills. You know, because honesty relate to our own identity, but uh, that is the most difficult. Yes, agreed, totally agreed. I mean, I, I say yeah because, as an artist, I reserve the right to contradict myself, to say this mm -hmm. and that, mm -hmm. and do both together without losing integrity or honesty. Because if we become too holy about ourselves, too wrapped up in the idea that we have some great message for the world, we're, it's the end. Um, well, we, we must not have a great message lightly. to the world, mm. but we have to give ourselves a gift. That means we recognize ourselves in the mirror to say, hey, this is me. So that moment is very hard to establish, you know. And to keep going. With yes, I think so. Continually, yes. Thank you, Weiwei. Thank you so much.
if we are going to make sure that we secure this planet for future generations, we need to learn to love the people who voted for things that we might disagree with. Everything is a toxic mess. What we want is a transition out. But, you know, what we have is an addicted society. And the fossil fuel industry continues to push those addictions. This is a moment for us not to adjust to things that are so fundamentally unjust.